Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to this month's edition of NDSU Extension Agribusiness's Agricultural Market Situation Outlook webinar. Uh, as always, uh, we have a number of specialists uh, from NDSU Extension who are going to speak on different parts of the egg economy. Uh, we're happy to answer questions. Uh, we save those until the end. You may use either the Q&A tool or the chat tool, but we'll get to them. Um, with that, I think I'll just go ahead and turn it right over to Brian Parman. All right. Um, so as we, we're closing out, this is our last uh, outlook situation and outlook for 2023. And so what I thought I'd do is a little bit of a, a year in review on some production cost uh, stuff, just more big picture, nothing, nothing super detailed uh, going on here. And then a little bit of an outlook as, as we transition into uh, uh, next year, 2024. So, like I said, I'm going to use some indices, and these reports came out just at the end of last month uh, from, from USDA. And so here are our uh, crop uh, crop farms uh, received and paid indexes. And all this is, is when, when I'm talking about these indexes, just a, an aside on how they work, they take all of the uh, production cost items, for instance, they throw them into a basket. And whatever that costs, in this case, 2011, whatever that total cost is, is, is 100. And then so if costs go up 10% for that whole bucket of costs, it would be 210. So in this case, uh, at 2011 was, was 100. 2022 was about 140. So in other words, production costs were 40% higher across the board in 2022 than they were in, in, in 2011. And we we hit the we hit that high uh, right as we began uh, as we went through 2022 and just into 2023. And last spring, when I was given these um, production costs kind of forecasts, I said, you know, there were the the spring production costs were going to be a bit lower, and they were. And a lot of that came from from fertilizer uh, costs coming down some, uh, and and they and they were last spring. And as we're moving into 2024. We can see those production cost items have come down a little bit more as well. So for on the crop production side, uh, the index falling from about um, yeah about 141 down to about 135. So off a little bit from last year. At the same time, the price is received for our for our uh, uh, products, whatever crop it happens to be. Uh, those are off from the from the highs that, that we're seeing most recently in that 2022, 2023 period. And then, and then the middle of last year, a little bit. In fact, that index has come down from almost 130 uh, down to, to just over a hundred. And so we're kind of looking at similar prices to what we're looking at actually in 2011, slightly higher. The livestock side, um, kind of the same thing. Uh, prices received really peaked last year. Now this is all livestock. This is not just cattle. So this is going to include swine, uh, poultry, uh, lambs, whatever, the, the, the whole gamut. And we see that those uh, prices paid have gone up uh, pretty dramatically since 2020 for our livestock producers. So in other words, those production cost items going up uh, pretty dramatically, uh, whereas prices pay, uh, received or prices paid have come down some. Prices paid have gone up quite a bit and the prices received have come down some. But we'll talk about uh, gen general in cattle in a second. Now, if we look at chemicals, so this is just specifically chemicals instead of all production cost items. This, this is really where, uh, from, from that index that I showed, where a lot of that's coming from. And peak, for instance, uh, uh, chemical prices. So those are your herbicides, pesticides, fungicides are all lumped into that, that chemical category there. Fertilizers its own and fuels its own. Uh, that peaking again, uh, spring of 22, and our chemical prices have come down from about 170 uh, down to 130. So about 30% compared. So so a pretty substantial drop there uh, in terms of chemical prices as we're looking into 2024 that we would expect to pay. Same thing with uh, fertilizers. Again, peaking there in that spring of 2022, kind of holding. Uh, you see it swings up there as we went into 23, and then our fertilizer prices, again, have come down uh, quite a bit. And so far, from everything I've gathered, uh, we're probably looking at just maybe a slight seasonal increase in, in fertilizer costs this spring, but not, 
not a big, not a big spike of any kind. It's going to be that typical seasonal increase, uh, uh, you know, that you see in, in urea and uh, starter and those kind of things. And then fuels off the highs, they, they uh, increased, the fuel costs did increase. A lot of this is diesel though. Uh, diesel prices were fairly, remained fairly sticky there through 2023 and, and it has come off. So on the, on the, on the chemicals side, whether it's fertilizers, uh, herbicides, pesticides, and fuels, well off the peak from a couple of years ago or even a year ago, and looking kind of like we're moving sideways. Uh, so essentially where they are now, kind of where we expect they, they're going to be uh, next spring. Uh, machinery costs, <coughs> those have essentially leveled out, okay? Peaked there in 22 and then, and then re uh, reached that peak there again in 23, and then just kind of moving sideways on machinery and then supplies and repairs trended up with the overall cost of machinery, but those again are moving sideways. So as I've said, in a lot of the talks I've given on a uh, machinery costs, we expect that you'll, you'll see an increase in the cost, but it'll be that typical one to 2% increase that you see most years, not the big 15 and 20% increases we saw a, a few years back. And then on the used equipment side, uh, some weakness this fall. Uh, as soon as a lot of the sales are logged and we get we get that data tabulated, we can see exactly where used equipment stands compared to a year ago. But the but it was it was looking like those used equipment prices were coming down. Those used equipment values uh, coming down during the fall. Interest rates. Uh, this came out for the third quarter of uh, of this most recent year, twenty twenty three, from the Minnesota. Um, Minneapolis Federal Reserve, which is our district. Okay. And so interest rates are down a little bit from what it's showing here. Okay. So th this came out in the third quarter. Uh, we're in the fourth quarter now, and the end of December will be the end of uh, the, the conclusion of the fourth quarter. But rates on things like operating loans had, had gone up to about almost 9%, 8.8, 8.7 .8, on variable rates. Machinery loans well above 8% and then real estate just below 8% across the district. And the district includes North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, Montana, and uh, Minnesota. And, and again, as I said, those rates are have come down since then. They kind of spiked there in, in, in October. And the other thing that's happened, the Fed came out uh, this week and said that they think that they're, they're going to, basically pause the rate hikes for a while. And, you know, you're reading a lot of things in the Fed's comments. Basically, you're reading comments on the Fed's comments. And a lot of times I, I caution folks that the some in the media and the talking heads read into the comments what they want to hear. You know, so uh, essentially they said they're going to reevaluate um, where rates are as more data comes in, that it may be the end of uh, increasing rates, but they also left open the possibility if things swing the other way, uh, they could increase them again. Now, then some came out and said, oh, the end of, it's the end of rate hikes and the Fed could be re lowering rates as soon as March. Well, they didn't, they didn't say any of that, actually, really. Um, like I said, it was going to be data driven that there may be, you know, that, and, and they said what they always say for the most part. It's just uh, sometimes, sometimes things are, Things are interpreted differently than they're, than they're intended, I would say. All right, then we look at commodity prices, uh, year in review kind of deal. Uh, and I just picked, and this came from the same USDA report. Uh, we've got uh, wheat prices, you know, they spiked there in 22 and have been pretty much a march downward. And this is all wheat uh, in the US down to an average of seven bucks a bushel. But we look at where we were uh, to start 2023 and, and substantially higher. Um, and then we've got uh, soybeans here, uh, just underneath it. Those have held held up a lot better than wheat, so to speak, and, and and corn for the most part. With corn prices, you know, now coming down toward the end of the year at well uh, below five dollars. And this is uh, futures, not not cash. We know that cash is considerably lower. And then when we look at the livestock prices and what your, our year in review here. This is the one where uh, uh, cattle and calf prices have 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 really stayed high. They really shot up in 2023, and they uh, they you know Tim's going to talk way more about that. 
But that's one of the things that's been driving uh, uh, the livestock on, as far as the, the prices received on that. And then if we look at what crops, what they've actually done, um, this is uh, the expected receipts for 2023 versus 2022 when the year finally settles out. Corn receipts uh, uh, down a bit. Um, as, same with soybeans. Uh, the only thing up is like fruit, but wheat down slightly, modestly down in 23 over 22 uh, for that. And then cattle and calves being up, but most of the rest of the livestock sector, the expectation is it'll, it'll be it'll be reduced a bit. Dairy is going to be down. Cash receipts in 2023 will be down for dairy, for broilers, you know, poultry, chickens, hogs, as well as as well as eggs. All right. And I say all that to look at this. And this is what our projection is. The most recent, which ended November of uh, November 30th. So just a few weeks ago. This is what it looks like for net farm incomes out of 2023 for those you know who are kind of going to be evaluating closing out the end of the year and it's going to be considerably lower than than the uh, 2022 year okay when it was what well, well over uh, uh, net cash income well over 200 billion and net farm incomes around 190 down to 157 and 151 and the big reason for that is uh, production costs mostly holding constant, with the exception of chemicals uh, coming down considerably, which does make a big, a big impact. But uh, you, you had your equipment, um, seed, uh, mach you know, machinery, and repairs, that kind of stuff going up. Uh, livestock, the cost of life breeding and replacements going up, even though receipts do at the same time. So it's still projecting 2023 to be an above average year comfortably above average with these lines that you you look at in this chart and this is by the USDA uh, comfortably above average in terms of net farm incomes when we close out this last year but way off the record uh, of 2022 I mean it's, in fact if you kind of want to draw a comparison the expectation is that 2023 will look a lot like 2021 that's that's kind of which which was again also above average so it's not a this isn't a, a doom and gloom or anything like that or or it's just just stating a fact that unless we set a new record, uh, it had nowhere to go but down, right? But then we look at what FAPRI put out for 2024, and, and I'll, I'll kind of point to this. So FAPRI put out 2023s, and this came out in September, and theirs is very close to uh, what the USDA just, just put out a couple of weeks ago. They've got it closer to $150 billion. Uh, USDA has it at about $151 for net farm income. So right there, pretty close. But you look at 2024, the expectation is that it's going to be lower uh, even than this last year. It's not not way lower, but probably closer to that 145, 140 billion uh, if you're looking at the chart and the data for it, which would put it more in line with uh, uh, the average, you know, more down, more down here. And the big the big uh, reason, yes, production costs have come down, uh, but not um, not 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 to the the five year average, uh, but much lower than the last couple of years. And then the fact that if we go back and look at commodity prices and where they are compared to those those record years, uh, quite a bit lower on on our major crops, corn, soybeans, and wheat. Um, uh, on the cattle, on the other hand, have been in good shape. So that's sort of the gist of it. That basically, as we as we're transitioning into uh, spring and looking at renewing operating loans and all this other stuff that right now the forecasts assuming nothing changes like you know we have average weather and average trade and average everything else this is what the expectation is of course we know that that doesn't mean we'll have average anything that grout and you know all all kinds of stuff late planning whatever else can can impact that dramatically but that's essentially where we sit so right now the future doesn't look as doesn't look gloomy, but we're probably not going to see these records uh, broken in the next year, uh, or or in any danger of being broken in the next year. It's probably going to look a lot more like uh, this last year, if not slightly lower. So that's kind of the year in review and what what we're looking at. Again, production costs probably lower uh, next year in in fuels, chemicals, and fertilizers. But but not not quite to that long run average and and uh, uh, Fran and, and Tim are going to talk a lot more about livestock and crop prices so I'm not going to go into that but I just want to show where they were 
and why net incomes were that were where they were and kind of where they are now compared to uh, compared to costs. So with that, I turn it over to Dr. Olson, and I hope everyone has a good holiday. And uh, I guess I'll probably see you next year unless uh, there's some questions at the end. So thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Frayne Olson. I'm a crop economist and marketing specialist with NDSU Extension. Uh, here's my contact information. So if you do think of something uh, that you want to visit about later, don't don't hesitate to reach out and, and contact me. Um, we will have some time at the end for some question and answer if, if there is something urgent or immediate. So <clears throat> I, I want to go through kind of key market issues. We're going to talk a little bit about the USDA WASD report, the World Agricultural Supply Demand Estimates that came out last week, last Friday. Basically, it was neutral for soybeans, corn, and wheat. I mean, there really wasn't a lot of new information. I'll go through kind of the, the small shifts and adjust they made, adjustments they made. So we weren't expecting that to be a big market moving uh, report, and it wasn't. Um, Right now, the key focus, you know, there's a couple things that the market is really focusing on. One of them is obviously the weather and the crop conditions coming out of Brazil and Argentina. And they are being watched very closely. Um, so, you know, my, my story is we're in a weather market. It just happens to be a South American weather market. And I'm going to go through later on today, give you an update on where kind of current crop conditions, some of the expectations for production, not only the USDA had, but also some of the private folks. Um, the other thing that I do want to follow up on and, and just remind everybody during this holiday season, as we get closer into Christmas and in particular between Christmas and New Year's, uh, the markets are open, but the trading volumes are really low. We tend to have very low trading volumes. It becomes a thinner market. Now, typically, if there's you know a nice, quiet holiday season, that means that there will likely be very little price movements. Um, prices will be relatively stable over the holidays. However, if there is some kind of shock or if there's something big that happens over this, this time frame, because the trading volume was very thin, we can have relatively large shifts just because there aren't a lot of buyers and not a lot of sellers. And so um, you know, to get market moves if there's some kind of big shock event uh, is not unprecedented. Now that's that's usually the anomaly. That's not the norm. The norm is to have uh, the normal conditions is to have, you know, limited price movement and a very quiet marketplace. So just uh, that's kind of going into the holiday season. That's what we expect to see. I Before I jump into the USDA numbers, I did want to give you a, a brief um, kind of review of somehow the private forecasters are looking at South American corn and soybean production. Um, one of the folks that's followed very closely is Michael, uh, Michael Cornier. Um, he's headquartered in Brazil. He has a soybean and corn advisor uh, is the name of his company. Um, he provides pretty regular updates on uh, soybean and corn condition ratings, as well as his forecast for production. Um, again, he's followed relatively closely by a lot of the traders and analysts. So I thought I'd bring him up and, and mention it. So if we look at soybean production, um, for soybeans, especially in Brazil, he's in the low end of the range. He's He's actually one of those uh, forecasters coming out saying, you know, given what we have seen so far, given the the current crop conditions, um, you know, he's looking at a slightly smaller crop than last year um, and down pretty significantly from the original expectations or original numbers. So just to, for reference point, when a lot of the private forecasters were looking at planted acreage and, and before all the seeding began, in particular in Brazil, a lot of, I think the, the average trade estimate was like 163 million metric ton, 163. Well, Cornier is down to 157. In Argentina, it's it's at 50. That's actually a little bit of a, a pretty substantial increase from last year, but recognize last year was a pretty severe drought. In fact, the third year of drought conditions in Argentina. On the corn side, uh, again, 118 million metric tons, which is a kind of a low end of, of the industry range right now. Uh, the big wild card is, of course, with the second crop or that safrina crop corn. We've talked about that in the past. Um, that's the, the larger of the corn acreage and corn production. Uh, we'll have to wait to see a little bit longer into the season before we get a better read on that. But given current expectations, kind of what we see, uh, Cornier is coming out with about 118 million metric ton. Again, for Argentina, increase from last year at 52 million metric ton. So Conab, which is is kind of the 
the Brazilian version of USDA, they're a little bit closer to kind of the midpoint of what the average trade estimates are, about 160 million metric ton for Brazil, about 118 million metric ton for Brazilian corn. And then Agra Rural, which is again, a Brazilian consulting company, similar to what Cornier does, has come out at about 159 million metric ton for Brazilian soybeans. Um, I, I haven't seen a recent update or report on what they're, they're looking at for Brazilian corn. So if we shift into what is USDA looking at? Um, so what did USDA say relative to what some of the private analysts, analysts are saying? So again, once again, the what I try and do is the top row um, in this table is the average trade estimate. So before the report is, is uh, released, some of the major news agencies like Reuters um, does a survey of private analysts and say, look, what do you expect the numbers to be coming out of this USDA report? And so they report not only the average of all those companies between 20 and 25 companies that report their, their formal estimates, but they also give the range, kind of what's the high and the low end of that range. Um, and towards the bottom highlighted in black, I have the numbers from last month's report from the November uh, WASD report. And then of course, in the very bottom highlighted in red is the number that we actually got. So I usually uh, present and remind everyone that for market movements, I mean, if we're looking at some kind of surprise numbers that come out of the USDA reports, we usually need to compare the blue line on top with the red line on the bottom, because that this is what the trade is expecting to see. This is the number that they were they have been trading on is what what they think is going to show up. And if that number is substantially different from what the red number is on the very bottom, which is actually reported, then all of a sudden we have this adjustment in expectations. So. Again, looking at not only the domestic numbers, which I'll get to in a minute, but also the international numbers, the, the USGA forecast came in very, very close to what current trade estimates are. So if you go across the blue line and the, and the red line, you're going to see there aren't much difference, pretty minimal difference. The biggest one probably being Brazilian corn. Uh, again, percentage-wise, that's a relatively small amount. So I would say it's still well within the trading range. All right, so when we get to the domestic numbers, so now we're looking at the ending stocks. How much green do we expect to have in the bin just before harvest of next year? Again, we're comparing the blue line on top with the red line on the bottom. Very minor adjustments to, to the information we got in November. In fact, there was really only two adjustments uh, in wheat. There was a, about a 25 million bushel increase in exports, which then took our ending stocks down. As well as in corn, we had a 25 million bushel increase in forecasted exports for corn, which again then reduced our ending stocks by the equivalent amount. So no adjustments on the production side, only minor tweaks on the on the consumption side. The soybean numbers were identical to what we saw back in, in, uh, in November. Now, the next report coming out in January is actually going to be one that will have some market movements or at least the potential for market movements. We're going to get a little bit more weather information out of South America, so we'll start to see what that what that looks like. But also, we're going to get the final official ending numbers for U.S. corn and soybean production. Okay, so we're going to lock in the final numbers for planted acreage, harvested acreage, as well as yield per acre. And there have been some minor adjustments being made as we get information from FSA, Farm Service Agency, on prevent plant acres. Um, and we're also getting some updated, uh, the ability to compare the survey numbers coming out of NAS, which typically shows up in this in this, um, this WASD report, with the official reporting that farmers uh, cer certified for crop insurance, as well as their FSA numbers. So again, in, in January, this January report will be a, a bit more of a uh, a, a larger, a bigger deal. So if we see some adjustments, especially on the production side, the last chance to be able to do that will be in the January report. So shifting into where are we with current weather, crop conditions, et cetera, I'm gonna start with uh, Brazilian soybeans and then move into Argentine soybeans. Not gonna be able to touch on corn today because of the, the time constraints, but the corn story will be similar and I'll, I'll comment on that just briefly. So for soybeans, just to remind everybody, uh, where are soybeans grown in Brazil? Again, the darker the green, the more bushels or tons are produced within the respective states. I do want to just point out and remind everybody, if we look at the two big in the north, the two big growing regions, Mato Grosso 
and Goyos, when you add those two together, about 36%, you know, typical year, 36% of the production is up in the north. And, and Mato Grosso is just because of the sheer size of the, of the area, one of those regions we spend a lot of time talking about. But I do also want to point out that when you get into the southern part of Brazil, you get Paraná as well as a real Grande do Sul. Those two regions, when you add those up, that's about 30%. So the southern part of Brazil, even though it's not as, as densely heavy with soybean production, still produces a lot of soybeans from a volume standpoint. So we, we are always trying to balance what's going on in kind of the northern part of, the, of Brazil versus the southern part of Brazil, because their weather conditions tend to be somewhat different. Last year, the northern part of Brazil had very, very almost ideal growing conditions, really good rainfall. They got timely rains, wasn't too wet, but wet enough. But it was the south or southern growing regions that really suffered. So last year, the yields in the north offset or were higher and large enough to be able to offset some of the losses we saw in the south. Well, now this year, the opposite is happening. So when we look at, now this is a, an estimate of drought severity. So this is this would be similar to our drought monitor index that we have here in the U.S. Um, this is from USDA Crop Explorer. It's a joint venture between the, uh, the people at NASA that collect all of the satellite imagery, as well as some of the data analytics that's going on within USDA. So this is an estimate of the drought severity. So be similar to, again, our U.S. drought index. So notice again in that northern growing region, especially Mato Grosso, and you get in the border in the eastern uh, uh, Mato Grosso and western Goyos, this is a big, big growing region with a lot of soybeans in it. So there are some drier conditions showing up in the north, and the current forecast for weather is to have very hot and dry conditions continue at least for the next week. So again, we'll be watching that pretty closely. However, in the south, notice that there has been uh, wet to some some areas of exceptional wetness. A lot of rain has been re re reappearing. Some of that is soaking into the ground and obviously recharging some of the low soil profile from the dry conditions they had last year. But it's also setting up for some the potential for some pretty good yields as we get into the middle of the growing season. So once again, we have this dichotomy or this difference between what's happening in the north versus what's happening in the south. It's just this year it happens to be flipped. So when we look at um, the crop condition, uh, so this would be NDVI, this is the vegetative health. So we're using satellite imagery. They're trying to take uh, 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 images and say, well, how green is this crop? How, how dark green or light green is this crop? And this is a, a, a map where you're comparing the, the greenness of the crop during this time period, this week, basically in the, the first week in, in December, you're looking at, so how green is the crop today relative to what we would normally see this time in history? So we're looking at the same week in time, but we're comparing this week to what we would normally see. So obviously white means that it's neutral. We're seeing what we, we normally see at this time. If you're looking at green, it's a little bit healthier or looking more, more, more robust than we would see normally at this time of year. But then of course, if you get into those browns or, or yellows, those would be, or even reds, those would be the areas where there's some of that crop condition that's that's below average or some of the crop health is, is suffering. And again, you can see on that border between Mato Grosso and Goyos, this pocket up here, there's got, there's some problems, there's some issues starting to show up. Now, one more comment, just to put this in context for everybody, this is the vegetative health for crops. So they screened out the some of the forest area, some of the pasture land area, but it includes all crops. This is not just soybeans, it's not just corn, it's not just cotton, it's all crops that are growing within the area. So we do see some areas of, of, of problems and trouble starting to show up, but it's still relatively early within the growing season. So these are the things we're monitoring as we move forward. Shifting really quickly to Argentina. Um, again, the Argentina uh, growing region for both corn and soybean is very tight, very compact. Um, Cordoba and Buenos Aires are those two air, two regions where, and as well as Santa Fe, that's really the kind of that core growing region. So for as we go to the maps, just recognize that here's this little bump in Argentina and here's Uruguay right here. There's a major, the Parana River runs up through the middle of Cordoba. Um, that region is, is the area we're going to be looking at and focusing on the most. So here's that little bump. Um, here's a... Uh, uh, 
Uruguay, and here's the rivers that we were talking about. So when you look at this core growing region from a soil, some a drought severity um, condition rating, there's still some dry areas and some pockets in that Cordoba area. However, recognize that this region has come out of three years of, of severe drought. So because it has been so dry for so long, it's going to take a while to recharge, recharge that soil layer, that soil moisture layer. Um, surface moisture is looking better than it has in quite a while, but there is still some subsoil issues that are going on. And that's what's showing up in this drought monitor map. But also recognize that it has been pretty good recharge in some of the areas in, in, the, in the kind of the eastern, southeastern growing regions in, in Argentina. When we look at crop condition ratings, again, this would match and actually link up pretty closely with what we just saw. So also recognize that in Argentina, the corn and soybean planting is still continuing. So they're a little bit behind plant, planting progress that we normally see in Argent, in Brazil. Um, and so they're, they're still kind of in the early stages of their planting season right now. So the vegetative health index isn't going to be quite as representative on what yields and yield potential might be, but it does give us a general indication of what the crop condition is at. So these are the core things we're watching right now. Um, export pace, uh, that we have had some ex pretty good exports in the corn side. We're still a bit behind on the soybean side. Those will be watched really closely as we move into December and the first part of January, but also these weather conditions coming out of uh, Brazil and Argentina, because those are, those are major competitors for the US, both in corn as well as soybeans. So with that, I will stop sharing. Let me get to my right spot here. See if I can stop sharing for a moment. There we go. And I will hand things over to Tim Petrie. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie with you, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. I'm kind of glad that, that Brian uh, talked about some of those things he did because we're just going to reiterate them here and mainly talk about cattle. But last time I did say uh, tell you that we were going to hold a webinar, a backgrounding webinar, and we did hold that on November 28th, as you can see there, and maybe uh, some of you joined us. And if that, if you did, that's fine. If you did not get a chance to join us, it, it, it uh, was recorded. And at the bottom, actually, if you just uh, Google NDSU backgrounding or uh, livestock beef, it'll come up. And there's our uh, five presentations that we did, including Brian that was just on. He did a, a number of budgets. And, and on that same web site you can see are the master budget that we use that you can use uh, you know if you're a lender and have a uh, cattle person coming in to talk about backgrounding it's there or for cattle producers and so on but I did a market outlook and Brian talked a lot of uh, different budgets with uh, both steers and heifers and slow rate of gain and so on and Carl Hoppy showed a, a lot of different rations very important if you're backgrounding cattle or, or feeding cattle is that there is been a big change in the implant rule uh, effective uh, mid-year this year in July so uh, I don't have time to get into that but uh, certainly something uh, very much of value in, in implant use and then followed up with uh, Jerry Stuck uh, doing uh, calf health so help yourself to that if you, if you would like to. So just going to start out with the uh, the uh, calf market here, and again, I think most of you have been on this before and know the color code, but, you, you know, the green is 2020, and then we just come on up to the purple 2021, the blue 2022, and then the red is, is this year. And so, uh, you know, with our cow herd going down cyclically the last four years, our prices have went up cyclically. And this year, again, the big things that affect calf prices are uh, our well-fed cattle prices, the supply of calves, and then corn prices. And so uh, our calf crop, you know, is a four straight year of going down. That's supportive to prices. And then corn uh, falling, as as Brian showed on his chart, uh, corn going down about $2 this year has been supportive to calf prices too because of that old adage, change corn, 10 cents, change fall calf prices in the opposite direction. So because of the low supplies, corn going down, 
and actually we'll see fed cattle in a minute being record high. We also have had record high uh, calf prices throughout the year. And usually they do peak out in the summer there, July and August and so on and back off seasonally, which they've uh, re reacted very normal this year and have came down. Sometimes you see actually has happened in the last three years as we do see after that low in, in October and into the first of November, sometimes we do see a spike there that we have not seen that spike uh, this year. And uh, and again, some some reasons for that and more on that a little bit later as well. But uh, uh, basically, one, as, as some of the things up here, corn prices, again, have been supportive. So that's one of the reasons why prices are as high as are. Uh, sometimes we have very good winter wheat grazing and in the south, that would be in, in Texas and Oklahoma. And uh, that sparks the calf market because they buy lightweight calves and, you know, a very cheap way to put on uh, gain on calves. Uh, this year, we haven't seen the spark up here in the calf market like sometimes we do because of, of drought down there. Uh, about 40% of the winter wheat crop is in drought in Texas. It's really hurting. In Oklahoma, they've had rains and, uh, and they have some winter wheat there and I just talked to my counterpart uh, down there and, and uh, you know there are some cattle going out in winter wheat more cows than normal this year because they want to maintain their cow herd with these high prices and, and heifers and, and, and not as many calves but their calf market the lighter weight calf market is, ha, has sparked a little bit better than up here and and another thing is up here, when the Corn Belt cattle buyers come into the market, they don't come into the market till they get the corn is harvested in Iowa, Southern Minnesota, Southern South Dakota, and so on, Nebraska. When, when they come into the market, that does give us a lift sometimes. And it has, it's just not showing up up on our, our price up there because of other factors affecting the market. And I'll get that to the minute. But basically there, you know, you, we have much better calf prices uh, this year and even and into uh, next year, we're going to have a lower calf crop next year. So again, it all depends on corn and what fed cattle doing and so on. But at least from a supply standpoint, we're even going to have fewer next year. So move along to the heavier weight uh, yearling prices there. And a similar story, just cyclically higher, higher this year for those same reasons. We have backed off and cash prices since September. And that's usually the case. And again, now I brought another slide to show you the big story obviously that's that's in the market now is how high the futures were the the gold futures the gold bars there are the futures today uh, that they've closed and are actually now below uh, 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 what the prices ha have been this year. So that would say, you know, cyclically, are we going lower? And, you know, we can do better than that uh, and, and actually have better prices in the futures are indicated, but they're just kind of in the doldrums now and a lot of things affecting that. And, you know, just going back to September 15th, those, uh, well, uh, or, or this is the fed cattle, excuse me, I said to every way, this, this is the fed cattle, but again, a very strong short supply and so on. The, the one red square way in the right hand side of your chart is the uh, the last futures we have for 2023 is the December futures. And, uh, and so uh, th that closed today about one, I guess one sixty seven fifty or so. And uh, in, you know, in the fed cattle market has been off a little bit here lately. The story again, like I started off trying to say is that those, you know, on September 15th, the futures were quite a bit higher. Uh, uh, 20, $25 to, to $28 in there higher than they are now. And so the big question is why did we have that decline in futures? And, uh, and uh, we're gonna just talk about that in a minute. So just uh, hang on and, and bear with me. Now we go to the heavyweight yearling prices. And again, the same thing, uh, looking at the fed cattle chart and the calf chart, there's uh, cyclically higher as well. Again, like fed cattle back on September 15th, the futures were quite a bit higher. Uh, 
uh, you know, $45 higher to so on. Uh, yeah. And kind of across the board there, the gold bars, again, are the futures for uh, next year's futures, 2024 futures that at one time were quite a bit higher indicating cyclic higher prices. Now they're about the same as they were as the prices, actual prices were this year. But again, we had a kind of a big downtrend in, in, in uh, futures prices there. And so uh, more on that in a minute. Notice, you know, there's uh, September high on the cash market. The cash market has declined some since September and uh, which is a normal seasonal pattern. Go down below and maybe talk more. I think I put this chart back in here with, with uh, not those red uh, uh, futures where they were in September 15th. But anyway, that's a normal seasonal occurrence. You see the last three years, uh, September highs there and, and they do go down. So uh, not necessarily any surprise on the, on the cash market there, but the futures market decline has uh, is something that we're going to talk about now. So the big question is, why did the futures market decline after 19th? September 15th, both in the fed cattle and, and the live cattle. And again, one of the things that affect these 750 pound uh, calves uh, are uh, the price of fed cattle, the, the futures price of fed cattle in that month when these calves that go into a feedlot would, would finish. And that going down alone would, would uh, you know, cause some uh, lower prices here. So let's go to this slide, a very busy slide. And I just want to make some comments before I get into this. And I, I know I have to move along here in terms of time, but there isn't just one reason why the, futures prices went down. There's probably 20 to 25 reasons, and I don't have time to go through every one of those, and they each deserve a chart, but I brought some along here just to show you. I want to emphasize that no one is to blame for the market going down, uh, you know, as no one was to blame for the market going up. They're both due to very fundamental, you know, supply and demand uh, fundamentals. You know, the problem is we can do a very good job of explaining why the market why the market went up and why the market went down because hindsight is 2020 you know people are saying now why didn't someone warn us that the market was going to go down like it did and the answer to that is no one knew that you know all these 25 30 factors would come together at the same time we knew they could but we just you know the, the stars didn't line up so just so start with the d slive cattle chart on the upper left hand corner and then in green is the cash market and you see the black there is the the futures and they went up all throughout the year from january on up to september 15th for again a lot of good uh fundamental uh reasons lower cows and the demand for beef was good and so on and uh and so uh you know they they finally did peak out there on on september 15th uh the speculators and the funds and so on were very they like to be in something that's going up and and this was one of the only games in town the stock market was low inter, you know uh, interest on money was low corn as we talked about before was going down and but cattle were going up the fundamentals were going up so a lot of good speculative t activity there uh, and so then we get them up to September 15th and you see the futures were above the cash market there the the, uh, the, uh, the futures were up there at these futures were up at 192, but the cash market as high as it got was 184. So there was a big difference there. And again, they have to come together when the when the uh, when the the market gets to maturity. So then the futures started coming down be, be, to get back down to the cash market. The the cash market is everyday supply and demand fundamentals is where the market should be, and the futures market is trying to figure out 
Oh, and, and again, there was all that optimism in the market. So then, uh, then you know, there was some selling in the futures market and so on, or some uh, interest in, in getting those close together. So they did come down together by October 15th, uh, right where they should be, the cash and futures market. And then also, I, I should add, you know, uh, there are, were a number of better opportunities coming along for people to put their money in rather than in cattle futures. Futures. the the stock market was going up in fact today the stock market reached uh, and yesterday and it is at record high levels today uh, again like I said at the beginning of the year interest was low and now you can get five to six percent on a six month CD so they're all their alternatives for investment and so on is you know another reason why some of the speculators bailed out of the money but anyway they got together then on October 15th, a cattle on, for you see in the purple era, cattle on feed report came out. And so you go to the right hand side there, the cattle on feed report showed more cattle than, uh, than even a year ago. And that got uh, some people all excited and, uh, and uh, saying, oh, USDA missed it. Now we got way more cattle than USDA said and, and, you know, all this. And that was not the case at all. There's a very good reason why we have more cattle, had more cattle on feed then and we do now. And that's because of the chart below that. We've got a record number of heifers on feed. And the reason for that is because of the drought in the Southern Plains. Last year, you know, 76% uh, of our cow herd was in drought and it's still 40% and down south is dry and getting into Arkansas and so on. So heifers that originally would have went into the uh, beef cow herd and been bred were were uh, put into feedlots and so on. And so that raised the number of cattle on feed. And what that is, is near term bearish because we've got more cattle on feed, which would be more beef production. But on the other hand, it's longer term bullish because we're going to have a smaller cow herd again because uh you know all these heifers on feed so kind of all those things came together but again you know there was no irrational going on there go down to the bottom left hand side uh, you know, on September, the the week ending in September 16th, the futures of September 15th was on a Friday. Feedlots on the top there were making very good money because the market had went up. So basically they were getting 184 for, uh, you know, uh, 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 fed cattle and they had paid just a little bit not hardly any more than that for the cattle going in so they were making good money and um, and then just go down to the bottom there where we see calculated break-even price uh, you know for cattle being placed on on September 15th their their uh, break-even price for this would be for the fed cattle going out was 185 but again uh the april futures of when those cattle would be sold were up you know uh uh very close to $200 and so you know they could pay that for feeder cattle and they could hedge and 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 lock in a profit so again nothing uh, nothing goofy going on there. But again, by the time we get down to October, more cattle on feed. Uh, Brian mentioned the alternative meats. Uh, hog prices are lower. Turkey prices are lower. Chicken prices are lower. So meat is cheaper. Beef is very expensive. So that, uh, you know, affected some in the consumer demand. Uh, high credit card debt getting debt, uh, debt getting into the holidays you know uh, other things for people to buy and so on is one of the reasons why fed cattle went down and then we go to the feeder cattle side kind of the same way we kind of mentioned those before but there's uh you know the november feeder cattle futures that already closed but i like to bring that november chart in and this is versus the cme cash settlement price they have to be the same when the when the market uh closes and you i i bring that in to show you they were the same that green line is that the cash settlement price, which is the cash market of all the cattle, where there are USDA market reporters, all the uh, seven to eight ninety nine weights, and it were you know including uh, three in North Dakota here in Napoleon Kiss and Mad Ann and so on. They came together, but again, go back to September fifteenth. Uh, they were uh, eighteen. 
dollars or so higher rate, you know, and, and then they came down to the cash market like they, they should. So again, I already mentioned this, but going over on the right hand side, the cash market did feeder cattle cash market did go down like it has done the last three years. In fact, on the bottom is the seasonal price pattern for feeder steers, and that's a 10-year uh, seasonal price pattern. And so the on the left-hand side is the index. So all we do is add up the average prices for every month and divide by 10 there, in this case, a 10-year moving average. And so we see what times of the year they're higher and what times of the year they're lower on the average. And so you see that September high uh, occurring and they go down and, you know, uh, you know, when we're the market going down like it did, I guess, is, is another example of why price risk management is something we need to look at. And again, when prices are record high, volatility is high. And so we're kind of seeing all those things come to fruition, come over to the bottom left hand side. You see here's feeder cattle, 78 weight feeder cattle versus fed cattle prices there on September 15th were $70 higher than fed cattle, which usually they're down about 40 or so. And so, you know, kind of reality has set back in there. So uh, a lot of other reasons, but again, we can, we can explain things uh, in hindsight very well it's just that looking ahead you know what's going to happen what's corn price is going to do and consumer demand and all those are, are all question marks we have but again just another reason why even though we're at record high price levels uh, I think we should consider price risk management so just a couple of things here here's the market report from North Dakota for last week and these are some of the things we talked about in in background but I want to kind just concentrate on uh, in the middle there you know on my charts I use the average price which is circled there for last week for for 550 weight steers was 269.55 but look at that wide range in prices there a $40 range in prices for the same weight and grade of calves at the same market and so those those uh, corn belt cattle feeders that like to that come in here, they like to buy those top really, really good calves. And so, you know, those are the ones at 289. On the other hand, since the market is kind of finicky now and there's a lot of unknowns and the markets went down, we're seeing more discounts for the cattle being a little bit off. There would, might be the smaller weights or, or wouldn't have shots or weaned and so on. So, you know, the, the, that's what's causing that big range in 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 uh, in in prices there again uh we've talked about the discount in heifers up there before and you know uh, 30 dollars for 500 pound heifers but you get down to, to get them up to about 900 pounds and they're the same price so brian's budget certainly uh, showed that there's you know heifers and we are going to keep a lot of heifers in north dakota I, you know particularly in west river weather was better this year they're likely you know if it continues raining down south we don't know that there is going to be a, a good demand even for replacement heifers so uh, uh a lot of things going on in the market again very volatile another reason why we should consider price risk management and uh, with that uh, just wish you all happy holidays and uh, and uh, I'll stop sharing here and uh, and turn it over to Ron. Yeah I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, in, end of the year farm income tax planning uh, some of this is kind of a, a refresher but but uh, it's always good to to be refreshed once in a while. We only got two weeks till the end of the year. And uh, that's when farmers, they have time now to, to work on their books. And as a course, we know far, the March 1st is the filing date, but I would encourage people to make a deposit by January 15th and, and pay, then you can pay with everybody else on April 15th. Um, if you can come up with how much you would probably be for a deposit. Actually, it's January 16th this year because of a holiday. And uh, but it's pretty easy if you paid in what you paid last year, you're OK for a penalty or two thirds of your liability that you owe. Um, and all this can be done on form 2210 F. So something to consider because it's it's uh, March 1st comes pretty quick for when you're trying to get all your your numbers together. 
Um, of course, we know about the 179 uh, deduction where you can buy a tractor right in the la on the last day of the year and deduct it. And there's also the 100% bonus, but that's phased down. So for this year, it's not 100% bonus. It's only 80% bonus. Okay. And it will go down to 60% the, the next tax year. I always like to talk about Schedule J. This is important. A lot of farmers miss this. If you've got a high income, what you do on Schedule J, you, you take that income and divide it equally by three. And the easiest way to explain that is that you, you have a low bracket down in the bottom and, a, and the next bracket up. You fill up your lower tax brackets. Yeah, and uh, it, and you can save quite a bit of taxes on uh, by doing an income average. It's just particular for farmers. Self-employment tax went up to one hundred and sixty thousand two hundred. Uh, went up quite a bit from one hundred forty-seven the previous year. Um, so if you've got a wage job plus your farm income and it gets over one hundred and sixty, then you've maxed out. But you still need to pay the Medicare tax on all of that income uh, above uh, above one hundred sixty. Um, uh, the estate, the estates, uh, the amounts went up to thirteen point four four million this year, um, and uh, and actually, there's not that many people that have that much a big of an estate. But if you do, it's it's pretty good. Social security, social security payments uh, for twenty twenty four are scheduled to go up about three percent. Where last year they went up about eight percent, I believe. Um, when you report your crop insurance proceeds. Um, if you got some crop insurance proceeds, you can defer them till the next year if you if you so desire. But technically, you cannot defer if you collect it on a revenue uh, policy. It's only the physical loss that you can defer. Uh, insurance companies may not break that down for you on a 1099 that they would send you. Also, if you had to sell some livestock because if you're in the dry area, especially in the northern part of the state, there's two provisions, the 133 and the 451. I won't go through this in detail, but the 150, one, one, uh, the 1033 uh, is for only draft, uh, draft or breeding livestock, and you can, you can, uh, you can. It does not have to have a, a declaration, uh, a, a emergency declaration, so you can defer that up for up to two years. But if there is a declaration in your county, it goes up to four years and it can be extended by the IRS after that. The 451 is for all types of livestock. There you must have a federal des designation of a, of a disaster and, th and that's for any type of livestock. And this is for deferring um, sales above your normal level. You may want to do a strategy for using the 1033 for your breeding livestock for your cows and maybe use the 451 for your calves. Also, you can defer crop and crop and livestock sales into the future. Uh, but usually if you sign a deferred payment contract, there's in big bold letters says if this if this uh, elevator or sales barn goes bankrupt, you are on the bottom of the list to get any money. But North Dakota does have a credit sale contract indemnity fund that, that may help if something happens. Um, also, you can, if you contract, uh, have a deferred payment contract, you may want to not do it all in one contract. Do it in several contracts. So if you're working on your income taxes with your tax preparer and you realize you deferred too much, you can hold back a contract. Uh, you, don't have, you don't have to defer it. The IRS will take your money anytime. And uh, so that's why it's some, sometimes good to have more than one contract. North Dakota had a big, big change this year, really dropped the North Dakota taxes. Um, they were low to begin with, but they're even lower now. And there's a big exemption. So if we're looking for married filing jointly, you can earn up to $74,000 and pay no tax at all. And after that, it's very minimal. Also, those of you that are getting property tax statements in the mail right now, you are eligible for a $500 property tax credit. You need to you need to get that done by March first, and then you'll get a credit on your next uh, next tax bill. I also t encourage people to look at the Farmers Tax Guide. Uh, this is a good publication, uh, publication two twenty five. Always work with your tax uh, professional uh, when you work on your taxes. 
and I will entertain questions uh, at a later time to, uh, when we get done. And so with that, I'll turn it right over to Dave. Yep. And my Christmas present to all attendees is that I will be skipping my talk for this month and I'll catch you in January. Uh, so the floor is open for questions uh, for any of the uh, presenters today. And we'll give you a minute or so to, to add any questions if you'd like. I would like to make one note uh, since I, I'm sharing my time uh, regard with regards to Frank's comment about thin markets. It reminds me about a story years ago about people cornering the orange juice market. If you remember that around Christmas time, it was a popular movie around the 1980s. And Ron, I know you've seen it. Yeah. Yeah, what, I, what, I, I can't recall the name right now, but yeah. yeah. Yep. Trading yep. places, right? That's it. Yep. 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 It should be mandatory viewing for all AG Econ majors, in my opinion. <laughs> yep. But as I've there seen, are no... Yeah, go ahead, I, th I think I've seen that movie, but... I don't. I, I I I vaguely remember it. We'll have yeah, to have that, a watch party. Yeah, that used to be a, a a sure deal because if you saw a frost coming to Florida, there might be a a lot of upside potential. But if it doesn't happen, there isn't a lot of downside potential. So yeah, then the speculators would jump on it. Yeah. Yeah. It's but one it of the be. best movies ever made. <laughs> yep. It hits on a lot of cylinders. Inclu including good agricultural economics. So, yeah. Right. All right. But since they are, there are no more questions, uh, we will be meeting next month, next year. I think uh, one meeting, just popped up. We did get one. Right. Let's go ahead and jump on that one. Give them their chance. Uh, Frank, well, this Frank. is for Frank. If you want to give them an answer. <laughs> Should we sell uh, out of spring wheat now or wait? Uh, based on what I see, I would wait. I'd, I'd try and be patient with spring wheat. I think there'll be some better chances as we get into into late January and February. Great. Thanks, Frayne. Yeah, and with that, we will be back next month uh, on January 18th. Uh, we will likely be making a little announcement to do a little bit of marketing before then, but uh, plan on joining us all of 2024 for our, our market situation and outlook webinar. Thank you. Mm -hmm.